This is the Modern American Dream Objective 2 about the demographic changes that take place in World War II and the post-war era, sp concentrating specifically on two things in particular. The Great Migration of the 1940s and the Baby Boom and the White Flight to Suburbia. So if you could, please take a look at your uh, study guide for Objective 2 uh, about those two items. Let's start with the Great Migration. Now, the Great Migration, as you can see by the chart here, is uh, uh, the migration of African Americans and other groups from the south to the northern factories and also out to the west, not so much for the industry, but for other jobs out there as well. If you take a look at this chart right here, you'll notice that from this area of the south, where, ter uh, where uh, tenant farming and sharecropping is still very predominant, a lot of African Americans predominantly are leaving to go to other areas. Uh, in the 1940s, or by 1940, 140 million Americans would leave the South and go to other areas. And again, they're primarily going to northern factories, but they're also going to places like Los Angeles, uh, Seattle, and Baton Rouge. You can see here California, there's so much migration happening out west during this time, that California's population actually grows by 2 million uh, during this particular time. Now, what were the reasons for the migration? Well, the number one thing was that uh, when for African Americans in the South, uh, the African Americans are leaving the South primarily uh, because of uh, farming poverty. Yeah, various aspects of them. Ever since the Civil War had ended, there had been Jim Crow laws happening in the South that uh, created additional segregation. But for many of them, it was simply economic. If you were a sharecropper, you were basically expected to use the owner's resources and land uh, and then share the profits of the crop with the landowner itself. That usually ended up with over 50% of crops going to the landowner. Now, while some African Americans were sharecroppers, a lot of poor whites in the South were sharecroppers as well. And for both of them, uh, it wasn't a good option. Now, the other option was tenant farming. And in tenant farming, you would rent the land, you'd keep the crop, crop profits that you got, but you'd still have to pay a tremendous amount of rent and resource fees. You know, you've got to pay for your own tools, your own seed, your own mules, your own horses, your own equipment. So in one aspect, if you're sharecropping, you're sharing someone else's land with them and the crop profits. In the other uh, system, tenant farming, you're renting the land, but you're paying for everything yourself, including the rent on the land. No matter how you looked at it, 50% uh, of the profits were going to somebody else. If you share cropped, they were going to the landowner, and if you tenant farmed, they were going to the landlord. So economically, it didn't make a whole lot of sense. And when you look at the fact that a lot of African Americans in the South uh, were being discriminated against through segregation and Jim Crow laws and also being, being uh, subjected to black codes that were designed to prevent them from voting, if at all possible, it just wasn't worth it to stay. Now, um, in 1941, Franklin Roosevelt issued Executive Order 8802, which declared that discrimination in hiring based on race, creed, color, or national origin was illegal. Now, this opened the door for African Americans to leave uh, the South and head to other places, and they did. If you want to take a look at where, once again, go back to the first slide and take a look at the chart that's, uh, that's there. Now, tenant farming is basically the idea that you're going to rent the land and keep the crop profits after paying the rent and the resource fees. Uh, so you keep the profits, but when you've got to pay for everything else, in sharecropping, at least you shared the tools and shared the crop and you use the owner's stuff. In tenant farming, you're renting the land, buying all your own materials, and you get to keep the profits, but you still got to pay the owner so that the owner gets paid for all the stuff that he's letting you use uh, as well. No matter how you do it, whether you're sharecropping or tenant farming, over 50% of your profit is going to a landlord. What's the point of staying down there economically? Especially when... Now another major uh, demographic change during this time, during and after World War II, is the baby boom and also the white flight to suburbia. Now the baby boom is very easily explained. Uh, a lot of guys had gone to war to fight the ultimate evil and Adolf Hitler, or they're fighting in the Pacific, or whatever the case may be. They're gone for a long time, and uh, their girlfriends are at home. They're writing letters to each other. They miss each other, et cetera, et cetera. And when the war is over, it's time to come home and for, time for them to see each other. 
Now, inevitably, that's going to lead to uh, a lot of uh, marriages during that time, millions of marriages after World War II. And initially, uh, most young couples didn't have anywhere to stay. They didn't have any resources. Um, uh, the, the wife was working in the factory during the war, but now she wasn't anymore. And the man was coming home from the war, but he hadn't really had a job. So they didn't really have the affordability to buy their own house at first. Uh, at some point, they're going to want some privacy. Well, once houses in the suburbs become affordable and available, they now get that privacy. And when they have that privacy, they can do whatever they want. And the result is the baby boom. 50 million babies born in this country between 1945 and 1960. The baby boom generation is one of the most famous generations in American history. They've kind of been this big bubble that's gone through the hose uh, as history has passed along. Uh, as they got into their 20s and 30s, they greatly affected things. As they got older, you know, many of the baby boomers by the late 2000s were, uh, or early 2000s, I should say, were getting uh, close to Social Security age and really putting a strain on the Social Security system. So the baby boom generation has been greatly influential uh, to the demographics of American history. But going back to uh, the uh, World War II era, let's take a look at another major migration pattern that happened during this time, and that was the white flight to suburbia. Now, shortly after the war, home loans from the Federal Housing Administration and the Veterans Administration made housing affordable in, in uh, outskirts of the cities, and this led to a huge demand for new housing. That demand for new housing led to the concept of suburbia. Now, suburbia isn't really, uh, uh, I mean, it is a place, but it's more of an ideal. If you look at this painting here, it's the ideal of the American dream. Clean cut grass and uh, the nice school to go to and everything peaceful, everything nice, no trouble, no problems, no poverty. In reality, when you look at suburbia, it may have been that. But the suburbs, as you, as you can see on the right side of the picture here, the suburbs are, you know, this whole area right here, an outskirt of the major inner cities that they were trying to basically get away from. By 1960, 25% of America uh, leaves the cities to live in the suburbs. And they really wanted to forget the uh, city life that they were leaving behind. Uh, this is going to lead to uh, major problems later on, as we're going to get into. Uh, but as many people uh, leave the cities themselves, most of the attention of American culture and most of the attention of the American government and their resources often turn to suburbia. Now, since the suburbs were outside of town, they were a huge boost to the auto industry uh, because now uh, men had to go back into the city and commute to go to work every day, and women would be left at home with the kids and no car. So the auto industry gets a boost because the two-car household all of a sudden becomes very important. When you leave the city, there is no more riding the trolley or the subway or anything like that. So now you're actually out in the countryside and you need not just one vehicle, but two vehicles. It also helps the concept of the drive-in. Here's the original Golden Arches, the original McDonald's in San Bernardino, California in 1954 or 55, I believe. And it also increased the concept of the drive-in movie theater, people going there to watch movies from their cars. On Sundays, a lot of these movie theaters were, uh, were a little bit different. They had, some of them had a cross put in front uh, of a blank screen, and they turned into drive-in churches, if you can believe that. And, of course, no uh, mention of this age would be appropriate without mentioning one other major concept that came about during this time, the suburban shopping mall. As people didn't want to go into the cities anymore, to do their shopping. They wanted somewhere a little closer. Uh, suburbs had actually been around since the 1920s, but the concept of suburbia and affordable housing after World War II actually made all these things a, a reality, and, the, and in the minds of, of a lot of people, the quintessential American dream. Now there's a flip side to that as well that we'll get into in here in a little bit, but we want to concentrate on, on how this all got started first. The guy who actually created this is a guy named Bill Levitt. Now, uh, Levitt and Levitt imitators, and you can still see aspects of this today if you go into various suburbs uh, around the nation. A lot of the houses look the same, mass-produced houses cramped together. 
Uh, the concept of suburbia has been something that's been with us for a long time, again created by a guy named Bill Levitt and imitators of his style. Now, Levitt had constructed military bases in the Pacific overnight during World War II. Every time they took a new island, there had to be a runway strip, there had to be a mess hall put up, a commander's headquarters, that type of thing. And uh, uh, he basically had pre-cut frames and prefabricated stuff that when he would get to a, a new island that the Americans had taken, just throw it up overnight. Well, after the war, he decides to uh, apply the same principles when he gets back. It's basically a cookie-cutter, snap-together approach to house building. Uh, you'd pour the concrete down first and let that dry, and then everything else, as soon as you came in, was prefabricated and just basically snapped together on site. The first Levitt Town was actually uh, set up in Long Island, New York in 1946. It's somewhat famous today. But it doesn't quite uh, underline, in terms of history, how easy it was to put these things up. The average Levitt Town could, would, would typically have, 30, on average, 36 houses built per day in a standard Levitt Town. Because it wasn't hard to put the houses together. With everything prefabricated, you just put them up. The uh, idea was that you could go into a shopping mall and you could pick from one of three designs and just tell, tell Levitt what you wanted. He'd put you on the list, they'd have your house together in no time, and you could move in. Now, mo most of the houses looked exactly the same. If you look down here, there's a, a little radical guy who decided he was going to put a window on a roof here. But outside of that, as you're going down the street, you can see that most of the designs are the same. A lot of Cape Cods were some of the original designs. And uh, the trees were newly planted. It's basically little potato fields they were turning into neighborhoods. Now, these houses, if they don't look exactly the same, are pretty close anyway. And the suburbs themselves were originally just all straight streets on right angles. It wasn't very uncommon for someone to come home and have to call because he lost track of where his house was and needed directions from a wife or a neighbor. Uh, that actually was a story that got repeated a, a pretty fair amount of time. But for a lot of people who were trying to get out of their parents' homes after the war and have something that they could call their own, in a lot of, a lot of ways it, it was the American dream. Uh, family TV time in the living room, weekend projects in the backyard, uh, patio barbecues, little league, neighborhood get-togethers, couples gatherings, that type of thing. Those were all pretty common in the 1950s. And some people really liked that. A lot of people in mainstream or in uh, counterculture at the time really mocked that and said it was a, a really uh, bad, nonconformist, almost sheep following the herd way of living. And it was a lot of that too. But it really just depended on the perspective that people had. For some people, this was the American dream. There was one other aspect about suburbia, not just Levitt towns, but other places as well. As well that uh, made it pretty distinctly unique. If you've looked at the previous picture or this slide right here, the, de the demographics in 1950 suburbs were pretty much the same. White, young, middle-class families. Typically, the men went away to uh, work white-collar jobs during the day, working in office buildings and the like, that type of thing, while wives typically stayed home. And uh, the kids went to really nice schools but again, uh, what do you notice uh, about all these pictures, except for, for one young man in the back, and outside of that, what do you notice about every one of these pictures? It's the idea that they're white, they're young, they're middle class, and just about every family in Levittown and in most suburbs was the same way. The reason for that was because minorities were not allowed. Bill Levitt uh, considered himself to be a builder, not a social engineer. And uh, uh, the suburbs were distinctly white. That's where the name White Flight comes from. Because as this affordable housing in the suburbs started popping up all over the place, whites left the inner cities. But when African Americans or other minorities tried to experience the same American dream, they were told, you're not welcome and you're left behind. And as a result, a lot of uh, African Americans had to move back into the cities. With the Great Migration coming north into the west, uh, the Great Migration only increased minority population in the inner cities when they weren't really allowed to go anywhere else. Okay, That's the white flight and suburbia in a nutshell. Thanks a lot.